the methodology for social science applied sociology module and we're now up to week 11 and we're on to activist research or activism research as it's often called so for today's class which will be a little bit on the long side i'm afraid um, we're going to have a look at feminist theories of research and science in general with a particular focus on methodologies and ideas around methodologies because obviously this is a methodology module and from there we'll slide into queer theory methodologies that's just a short piece because there isn't a great deal to say on that um, both feminist and queer theory are examples of activism research so we'll give you a more general um, overview of what activism research is it's possibly something you might be interested in for dissertation perhaps um, from there which is very, very theoretical of that, will slide into looking at issues of bias in surveys and interviews and such like, which is a bit more pragmatic. Um, some of that, that uh, element around bias you might want to include mention of in your second assignment, perhaps, if it's relevant. And then a little bit of support for how to lay out the interview uh, for the um, second assignment. And that's pretty much it um, for lecture 11 if you do hear any weird noises um within this powerpoint that's because there are road builders out the front of my house digging up the road and their machines are rumbling and thundering and banging and crashing away and there's nowhere in my house that's quiet where i can go and sit and record this so do bear with now this is a bit of a recap from last week hopefully you will recognize the photograph and the name Sandra Harding, who is still going strong. Um, she was the lady who uh, developed standpoint theory, per se, she didn't invent it, but she did do an awful lot of work on it and it's become almost synonymous with her. as a, an idea that she sort of ran with and made a lot more of than previous thinkers had done so. Hopefully you will flash back to last week and remember what standpoint theory is, but just in case you don't, here's a quick reminder. Standpoint theory is the basic argument every single researcher in, well, really any kind of a science for that matter, or form of academic discipline. Um, but in this instance, obviously we're thinking within sociology, but it, it could apply as much to the study of history or the study of chemistry or the study of biology or any other subject under the sun you care to think of that's capable of being academically studied. Um, every researcher in those disciplines comes with their own biases and baggage, their own ideals, beliefs, convictions, likes, dislikes, etc. And therefore they are not neutral. So as much as the hard sciences and those social sciences that aspire to be like hard sciences, talk about neutrality and value neutrality and objectivity and so on, she argues you, you can't really get that because when all is said and done, researchers are just human beings. And so we come with the same baggage that any other human being comes with. However, she goes on to say that whilst an individual researcher is inevitably subjective and bias and sees everything from their own standpoint in life and that standpoint is influenced by factors such as social class culture race religion gender all of those usual factors that people talk about in sociology nonetheless the entire academic subject in this case sociology can attain what she describes as um, hard objectivity or strong objectivity by the amassing of different points of view. So if you have one researcher who is a middle-class white man and another researcher who's a working-class black woman and another researcher who is a disabled Asian upper-class man and you, you come up with combination after combination after combination, it's the amassing of all of those different diverse points of view together which then turns the subject into a much more objective subject. Whereas if a particular academic subject, and this has been the case historically, is dominated by the vast majority, if not indeed sometimes all, of its students and 
paid professional researchers and, and lecturers and, and academics of one shape, size or another are all quite similar in their um, demographic backgrounds. The same race, the same religion, the same social class, the same gender, blah, blah, blah. If they're all quite similar to each other in terms of those demographics, then you're more likely to get a very slanted academic study in that everyone is thinking from the same angle. You don't get the overall balance of different varied points of view. Now, this is all largely based upon the assumption that people fit demographics which make their um, life experiences and ideologies and so forth predictable. That is to say, most middle class white men will think one way, most working class black women will think another way, most um, upper class Asians will think a different way, so on and so forth. That may, that's, that's a commonly held point of view in sociology generally these days, as well as many other academic disciplines, not just sociology. That doesn't mean, of course, that it's correct, just because it's widely held and widely believed and doesn't mean it's um, not subject to um, revision as an idea. Uh, you get the, the flip side of this, um, somebody who was, wasn't a sociologist, she was an, an economist and a philosopher, um, Ayn Rand Ula in America, argued that the bedrock minority in any society is the individual. And that just because two individuals are s similar on one or two um, demographic measures, they've both got the same skin color or they've both got the same set of genitals or whatever, does not mean they will have shared life experiences, shared politics, shared outlook, shared ideology. That each individual is different. In the same way that um, you can have two brothers, two sisters within the same family. Who, who are same social class, same, same whatever, but who have very different outlooks and very different life experiences. We are all individuals, except for that guy in the Monty Python film, who apparently is not an individual, but we all are um, different from each other. And therefore you can't shove, at least according to Ayn Rand, you can't shove people into these broad sweeping categories where you assume they're all much of a muchness in outlook because they've got the same colour of skin or the same, they go to the same religious building, the same church, same mosque, same whatever. You can't assume people fit predictable molds in terms of their outlooks or their life experiences. So not everyone would agree with Harding on that kind of approach to assumed views and experiences, but quite a lot of people would. Um, where she shifts into other ground that is um, maybe more open to disagreement, to more widespread contest, is what's sometimes referred to as an inversion thesis. So she argues mainstream people, particularly those who come from um, what we might loosely term privileged groups, I'm, I'm a bit chary of using that word because it's it's so overused these days. It's often taken perhaps in a context it doesn't really mean half the time, but somebody who comes from an elite group in society. Now, historically, getting a good education, which would enable you to go on to become a scientist, uh, an academic lecturer, a researcher, something in that vein, was expensive, it still is expensive, I know that, but it used to be even more expensive than it is these days. And therefore it was once upon a time the, uh, the, the kind of root career path that only those, those from very well-heeled families could go down. And if we go back quite a few decades in history, then obviously it was entirely men who went down that path. Hardly any women went down that path. Um, women's access to academia, at least in this part of the world, does differ in other parts of the world, but in this part of the world, is quite recent on the historical scale. And so um, it's not simply a case of saying, oh, well, it was, it was only men in education, as if somehow every man on the planet or every man in the country was privileged in that way. 
because the vast majority of men were too poor to afford an education. So whilst it was all men in academia, they were men from a very limited social range. They were men from a very wealthy background, not all men by any stretch of the imagination. And when women did gain access to education, higher education, again, it was women from very wealthy backgrounds. It wasn't all women by any stretch. So the idea of um, access to academia, both as a student and then as a qualified practitioner, having been limited to a very elite, very well-to-do group is historically the case in just about any country you care to look at. Harding's argument here is that if you live in that bubble of wealth, that bubble of privilege, then your life experience is somewhat limited. At least she felt it is somewhat limited. Other people might disagree on that, but that's that's no road. Um, so you tend to see everything through the lens of your own wealth, your own life experience, your own um, assumptions about the world. Whereas other people, as we move into the 20th century and education, gradually, gradually begins to disseminate down social classes, uh, the provision of grants back in the day when people could get grants for going to university, um, meant that you had more lower middle class people, more working class people going into academia, more women going into academia, uh, more people from ethnic groups who rarely had significant wealth, at least not in this country, um, going into academia. And universities often opening up their doors at a religious level. Once upon a time, a lot of universities were run along religious lines, so you had to be a Catholic or you had to be a member of the Church of England in order to go. So if you came either an atheist or you came from one of the minority religions in this country, then you, they wouldn't let you in in the first place. So there, there's all sorts of doors that were being opened to different groups. And her argument with the inversion thesis is that if you come from one of these um, less privileged groups, less, less well-off groups, then you bring with you a much broader, richer life experience. So when you start to study academic subjects and hear theories and, and learn about research techniques, this, that and the other, then you view it through a different lens from those people who come from the very well-heeled elite bubble. Because you're, I suppose everyone to some extent is in a bubble, but arguably the, the lower down the pecking order you are, the less insulation your bubble provides you, the more you are subject to rough and ready experiences. Um, although from what we are increasingly learning of things that have gone on in boarding schools and private schools, perhaps some of them have been pretty damned rough and ready in terms of, of kids exposed to violence and sexual abuse and Lord knows what else. So it may not be the case that the well-to-do are quite as um, safe and secure from risk and violence and threat as historically they have been assumed to be. But that's a whole other issue. Um, so in this sense, the, the inversion is the assumption that those from the well-to-do backgrounds were privileged, not just in terms of their money and their access to social um, infrastructure, but also privileged in that they, they would their, their point of view was the dominant point of view. Whereas the, the idea of inverting that inversion thesis is that you have a better life understanding if you come from the bottom of the heap than if you come from the top of the heap. And therefore your opinions and views will have more weight to them. And you could certainly argue that as we get into the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s particularly, then identity politics really accelerates. And um, what once upon a time was more civil rights protests turns into this almost faddy obsession with with different identities and the idea that um, if you are so-called oppressed, then your views are somehow better and more worthwhile than people who are perceived as being in the lack of luxury. And so this idea of an epistemic advantage that some epistemologies, some um, routes to acquiring and justifying knowledge, which is what epistemology is, are 
more advantageous than others. If we went back, um, let's say 200 years ago, we could argue that the uh, routes to knowledge favored by the very well-to-do in academia were the ones that were given the advantage. Is that still the case in the year 2020? Or have we now seen an inversion of that? And nowadays, um, is it the case that if someone can tick a few boxes on uh, an identity politics checklist, their, their opinion is somehow deemed as having more weight and their epistemology more worth listening to than someone who is seen as too privileged, too much of a silver spoon, and therefore not worth listening to anymore? Or is that an exaggeration? It depends on your point of view of, of life and your experiences in whether you feel listened to, whether you see who, which other people you see being listened to and which other people you see being ignored or dismissed as not knowing what the hell they're on about. And if we translate epistemic advantage into um, everyday language, then it's effectively saying this person does know what they're talking about and they have the epistemic advantage. And that person over there, they don't know what the hell they're all about. They have no epistemic advantage. In fact, they have disadvantage because nobody thinks they know what the hell they're on about. We'll come back to that idea as we go along. Um, now, when Sandra Harding started out as a young woman in academia, as a student and then a, a newly qualified academic, there were relatively few women in the social sciences and even fewer women in the hard sciences, what these days is referred to as STEM. And so part of her argument formulated in those early days was that because the majority of students were men, the majority of lecturers were men, the majority of work and researchers were men, and people who wrote books and journal articles and whatnot in, in academia were men, they de facto tended to write about things and research into things that interested them. But who honestly wants to write a book about some subject that bores them to death? No one. Um, so it's, it's natural enough that they would write about, everyone does that. Everyone writes about stuff and researches into stuff that they find interesting. That's, that's just normal. But her argument there is that men en masse tend to be interested in the same things as each other and not interested in the sorts of things that are relevant to women. So as more women got into academia and got qualified and got jobs in the area, they would start researching into things that were of interest to them, which would break new ground in an academic sense. Um, that includes what these days might seem like, I suppose, fairly stereotypical things but which were new areas of research in the 60s and 70s, things like housework, reproduction issues, um, studying marriage and romantic relationships and so on. So at, at that point in time, that was new ground. Part of the ongoing debate was, did women bring something else to the table other than an interest in new subjects, different subjects. So was it just the subject matter that they were bringing to the table or was it also, for example, methodologies and epistemologies? So do women have an interest in different styles of um, carrying out research? So are men, for example, one of the arguments made was that men were more interested in number crunching, in quantitative studies, in experiments, Whereas women were more interested in the, the sort of human face of research in qualitative studies, in interviews, case studies, getting a real sense of people and their lives, the, the more kind of caring, sharing side of research, if you want to put it in that way. Uh, and that they might also have their own ways of knowing that that's not necessarily just the old kind of slightly corny thing about women's intuition, but just the general notion that women learn about things, study, grasp ideas in a different way than men grasp ideas and learn about things. Quite a few feminist researchers in the 60s, 70s, 80s were advancing those kinds of arguments, but not all. So you've got one there, Helen Longino, um, in the late 80s saying, well, actually, no. Um, 
there, there are no peculiar female or peculiar male styles of acquiring knowledge. Research is research. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, you're going to be just as capable of either the number crunching experiments or of the qualitative interviewing touchy-feely approach to research. There is not one method or one methodology that is more peculiarly female or more peculiarly male than another. So whilst the subject matter, things like I know, studying housework versus studying working in the factory, what some of those might subjects might more appeal to men and some might more appeal to women researchers, but the actual approaches, the methods used are much of a muchness. So not everyone went down that line. Now, Sandra Harding is, um, you know, the decades have gone past. She's now of retirement age, although she's still working and researching and writing and what have you. Um, we're in the 21st century. So is your experience, and this is a, where it's a bit of a shame that we can't directly discuss this, but we do have the social media outlets to chat in. Do your experiences as students in 2020 significantly differ from what we know of student experiences in 1970. So obviously these days, and this particular class is a, a good example of it, practically every student in the class is female. Um, that's, that's nothing odd or weird to West Suffolk College. Go to pretty much any sociology class anywhere in Britain and you will find the majority of students tend to be female. Um, an awful lot of the lecturers, not all of them obviously, but a large swathe, swathe of the lecturers tend to be female, a large swathe of qualified researchers tend to be female. So there is much more balance, if not indeed a preponderance, of more women involved in social sciences than men involved in social sciences these days. Um, has that had a significant change? Or have things more stabilised now and reached a, um, a balanced approach or even a kind of a top-heavy approach slanted towards female interests? So as female students in 2020, are you interested in different subjects and different methodologies and different epistemologies to male students in 2020? Uh, and so this is where we could put Glenn on the spot and expect him to somehow answer on behalf of all men. <laughs> or, or is it the case that actually the things that interest female students and female academics are not particularly different from the things that interest male students and male academics? And it's all much of a muchness now. How do we understand these shifts and turns and changes of gender relationships in 2020 compared to 1970. Because it could be argued, and I'm certainly argued, that there are a fair few academics writing from a um, strongly feminist point of view who write as if we were still living in the 1970s. We don't necessarily seem to have accounted for some of the significant social changes that have happened in the decades since then. Has the theory moved with the times? An area for debate and discussion, at any rate. Um, one of the topics which was um, hotly argued in earlier decades by feminist scholars and indeed by non feminist scholars who opposed these arguments, well, at least some of them, uh, was if science back in the 70s was very male dominated in terms of demographics, um, arguably by extension in terms of interests and methodologies and so on, was the solution to ditch it entirely, to chuck male style science out the window and create a brand new style of science, whatever that might be. Or, or was the solution to simply expand, so not ditch the science, but expand it, bring in more women to academia, so we change the demographic balance, but also give emphasis and focus to topics that interested women. We've mentioned a few of the 
stereotypical ones already. And maybe if if it transpired that the majority of um, qualified female academics were more interested in different types of methodologies or what have you, then that would kind of balance itself out over the course of time. Harding's stance was the second one. And she referred to that as successor science, that this more balanced form of scientific research and approach to the scientific community would balance out and succeed the um, predominantly male approach. So she didn't want to ditch the style of science that existed. She wanted to expand upon it. So keep the number crunching, keep the um, approaches towards value neutrality where it is possible to try and have value neutrality, but also bring in other factors that were more centered in female experience, which includes things, for example, like reflexivity. Um, but obviously there were other people saying, no, ditch the entire shebang and start something else completely different, completely new. Clearly that hasn't happened. Uh, we're in 20 dominoes, because it may yet happen. But, but we're in 2020 and it has not happened yet. We still have the same basic science that they had in 1970, except there are more women involved. And you could argue there have been shifts in focus on research areas, possibly some shifts in the popularity of certain research methodologies over other research methodologies, um, changes there. Another aspect which Hardin argued as part and parcel of successor science is that it should have this feminist focus. What is the feminist focus is not just about getting the numbers up in terms of more women students, more women qualified academics. It's also what she argues as an emancipatory approach. Now you could track this back to Karl Marx's views on sociology of saying that sociology should not just describe society, which a lot of sciences tend to be descriptive. They are describing the way the world is. Karl Marx said sociology should be what these days we would term activist. That is to say, it should be aiming to change society. So the describing of society is only the first step on the road towards changing society and obviously changing it for the better rather than changing it for the worse. But this, of course, is better according to Marx, not better according to anyone else. Um, so in this same kind of vein, Harding was argued that science that comes at it from a feminist angle at any rate should be selecting its subjects, selecting, selecting its techniques for research, its methodologies, with the aim of liberating society in the first instance women, but um, Sandra Harding is more within the second wave of feminism. The third wave of feminism broadens its remit. It's a very, very, very broad church, and I do use that term intentionally because I think there is quite a religious fervor about it, but that's a whole other discussion in itself. Um, it broadens its remit to include not just women, but transgendered people, um, gay men, bisexual men, all sorts of people that um, second wave feminism wasn't particularly interested in at all. So that, that, depending on whether you're coming from a second wave feminist point of view or a third wave feminist point of view, if you're coming from either of those at all, of course, um, the, the aim would be to emancipate different groups. So does the research help improve the lot of women or indeed of these other third wave groups or does it make no difference to them if it makes no difference to them at all the argument becomes why bother doing it why bother researching that thing if it makes no difference so there were, would be some subjects that might be deemed as failing to emancipate and therefore if the, we ever reached a point in time where the majority of research scientists were of a, a feminist ideology then those subjects presumably would not be studied either at all, or at least only by a tiny handful of people. Um, should that be the focus of research? Would it be the focus of your research, whether you're feminist or not? Would you want your research to be used to liberate oppressed groups? Is, or is that the intention you would set out with in terms of conducting research in the future, if you were employed as a professional researcher? 
Um, one of the other arguments is that not only are there perhaps different approaches to subject matter, different things of interest, possibly different approaches to methodology and different approaches to the eventual impact of the research, whether it emancipates or doesn't emancipate, etc. But perhaps also a different ethic. Um, Lawrence Kohlberg, a uh, psychologist who wrote some still very well-known, very prominent papers and books around how children develop their moral standards, their ethics, um, developed a pyramid, quite inspired in many ways by Maslow, this sort of step up system as people step up these various tiers of more and more mature forms of ethical viewpoint. Carol Gilligan came along a little bit later and said, well, Kohlberg has studied and conducted his research almost entirely with boys. And quite without realizing it, what he has developed is an understanding of male ethics and male moral standards. He has assumed this applies to women as well, but he's not checked. So she conducted her own research, developed her own theories, and came to the conclusion that girls develop their own moral values, and, and that continues on into adulthood. And these ethical values of women are different from the ethical values of men. So her argument was that the ethical values of men, as de facto described by Colbert, tend to focus on issues of fairness, justice, um, equality of distribution, that sort of thing. Whereas the values of girls and women tend to focus on caring and nurturing and looking after people and paying more focus to the vulnerable than the not vulnerable, the less vulnerable. So she developed her own, own theories and own approaches, and you could potentially make the argument that the kind of ethical values often applied in research, are they more masculine, more at the Kohlberg end? Or as feminism has moved forward and gone mainstream, are we seeing more and more integration of female care values into um, sociological and psychological uh, research ethic standards. And Carol Gilligan went on to found what these days is known as care ethics. And any of you who work in the care professions, well, you will know her name because we've banged on about it several times in class. Um, but undoubtedly, when you're packed off on training days and that kind of thing, you will be immersed in care ethics. Not just Gilligan's, but people like Neil Nodding's and all the horror after other care ethicists uh, who have their ideas on how those who are paid to care for others, as well as those who do it out of sheer love rather than money, caring for relatives and friends and whatnot, um, how they should go about caring for other people. What's the moral way to do it? So is there a difference in ethics between men and women? Or as third wave feminists have criticized Gilligan for, is she a bit like out of date and old fashioned in assuming that women are the caring sex and men are not? And it is modern ethic, uh, modern ethical understandings, are they a bit more sort of grey, where it's neither measurably male nor measurably female, but floating somewhere in the middle? Um, so are there different, more masculine and more feminine approaches? Um, a lot of, I have to say, well, I don't have to, but I'm going to say, um, hot air has been generated in this area with very little concrete detail. Let's give you some examples of things suggested. Archival research, when you go out, go and dig up pre-existing information like you did for the first assignment where you were digging up newspaper records, um, tends to predominantly focus on things like public records and official documents, government papers, that sort of thing. And the argument made by some feminist um, critics is that that is essentially um, a masculine approach because this is focused on power structures and in the viewpoint of many many feminists power structures in the west are patriarchal um, there are those who suggest they're not patriarchal anymore and they were once upon a time but who suggest that patriarchy in the west at least has 
gone by the by as the de decades have rolled on, whereas other feminists are very, very adamant that it still very much exists. Um, the feminists in fact school of thought argue that public records, government records, official documentation are part and parcel of the patriarchal structure, and therefore it tends to be more men that are interested in looking at them. Whereas women are more interested in the um, non-official, the unofficial documents that people keep, like their diaries and their journals. Um, these days, I suppose you could say things like online blogs and things like that. Um, the stuff that people write in an unofficial capacity has more interest. Is that the case? Is one set of documents somehow masculine and the other set of documents somehow feminine? Or is this a bit of a, a mental point of view? Community self-study projects are developed within communities where people within communities study themselves and participate in the research, you know, interview each other, survey each other, that sort of thing. Um, so it is from within the community that it is developed. And that is argued as being a, a feminist approach, um, kind of self-determining studies. Whereas the more traditional styles of experimentation and research where a, an academic comes along who's not a part of the community and studies people who are within that community, writes up a report and then goes away again. That what you might loosely term outsider approach or outsider research is at least by some people, characterized as a rather masculine patriarchal approach. Um, Hardings describes feminist research as being undertaken by women, on women, for women. So the academics are women, the people being studied are women, and once the journal article or book or whatever it is is published, obviously you can't prevent men reading something, but the assumption for those writing it is that the majority of their reading audience are going to be going to be women. So they're explaining to, to a, a female readership things starting from a, a default understanding that they will have an insight and knowledge of certain issues. Whereas by default, and I've, I've not actually encountered anyone who says that masculine research is done by men on men for men, but as a, if, if we're taking Harding's measure of feminist research in that way, would the de facto implication be that there is research by men, by male academics, on men that is written to be read by men? Would that be the male approach? Or flip side of this, would it be more the idea that male academics come along, they study women and go, oh, how interesting, and then write books about them that they assume will be mostly read by men? If that happens, and obviously it does happen, um, is that a bad thing? Would it be equally bad and desirable if you had women academics writing about men and publishing it for a mainly female readership? In other words, a, a person studying a group they're not part of and then publishing up the information to be read by other people who are also not a part of that group. Almost borders on anthropological research. You know, going up the Amazon, studying a tribe, then coming back and writing a book about it that's going to be read by British people or Americans or anyone other than the Amazonian tribe in question. Is there anything inherently wrong with that? Participatory research is a bit more like uh, when Barry came into the class as a guest lecturer and was talking about his own action research uh, as a trainee teacher where he was um, experimenting with mobile phone usage in the classroom. So there, uh, that kind of participatory research versus an outsider research approach. In the more outside approach, the people being experimented on don't know they're being experimented on, whereas in a participatory approach, everyone knows they're part of an experiment, and they help to shape and form that experiment. Um, so there is full-on participation in it, but action research is an example of participatory research. Is one more feminine, one more masculine? Or are we all gender neutral now? Or um, even if we're not gender neutral, do we see these ideas as old fashioned rather than as current? That's something that you can discuss via the online chat groups as to what your particular take on that one is. Now, if we move on to look at issues of research, 
Are there distinct areas? Now, we've already mentioned this idea that maybe there are some topics that are of much more interest to women than they are to men. I take a, a fairly obvious stereotypical example here. Um, issues connected to female biology and gynecology, those sorts of areas of study. Um, is a, a woman conducting, whether it's medical research or sociological research, whatever style of research it might be, is a woman conducting research into those areas connected to her own biology and the biology of other women um, better placed to do the research than a man is? In that the, the things she is studying will directly affect her own life. And depending on her age, I mean, obviously, if it's a 20 year old woman studying the menopause, she won't have direct experience of it, but she will have kind of perhaps experience through mother, aunts, grandmother, whoever, seeing other women in her life experiencing the menopause and something she will presumably hope to live long enough to experience herself eventually. Um, will therefore a w woman researcher come at it differently from a man researcher? coming at that sort of a subject, and vice versa. So let's say it's studying something peculiar to male biology, yeah. the impact of the prostate gland or something. Um, would a man researching that subject have a very different take on it, different understanding of it than a woman researching that subject? So is there some kind of measurable difference? And therefore it is preferable, possibly, that certain people research certain subjects because of their direct personal experiences. Um, what about the argument, um, going to the picture on the bottom right, that women might favour more um, qualitative styles of approach, the interviewing techniques, the surveying techniques, that sort of thing. Um, and the quite widespread notion that Women have better interpersonal skills, they're better at reading body language, they're better at reading facial cues than men are. Um, therefore, would they be better qualified at conducting interview style research than a supposedly insensitive man would be? Or is that an outdated preconception, an outdated view, and actually men are no worse, no better? at reading body language and facial cues and so forth as part and parcel of interview techniques than women researchers are. Interesting to get your points of view. Uh, vivisection experiments have gone on for oh, a long, long, long time. In fact, we can go back to ancient Greece when some of them were conducted on other human beings, usually slaves, um, being sliced and diced while they were still alive in order to gain medical knowledge, quite graphic and horrible as a conception. Um, is that a technique that women would have developed had science been dominated by women rather than dominated by men? I mean, there are plenty of women who work in vivisection laboratories and conduct vivisection experiments. Would they have done so? Would that technique even have been developed in the first place had science been more of a female occupation and a male occupation? Or is that just a very romanticised, rosy, spectacled point of view that wants to see women as all carey, sherry and hugging, when actually they're just as capable of inflicting pain and misery and suffering as a man is? Um, it's, it's still very much a fad I can see at the moment on social media, lots of dreary memes arguing that countries with female leaders do better and have more compassionate approaches to the coronavirus problem than countries with male leaders. Um, I suspect that is a very selective, kind of slightly blinkered view of ignoring the, the female leaders of this world, who are just as incompetent and awful as the male leaders of this world. But it's an argument that's popular and does the rounds and is built upon this somewhat Victorian notion of women as the caring sex and, and men as the selfish sex. Does it bear scrutiny? That book cover there, The Biology of Doom, is a book about germ warfare research. There are forms of scientific research, having mentioned yet, emancipatory research, aimed at setting people free, the whole activism research. The, there is also research into a whole raft of scientific subjects, which, far from setting anyone free, 
is likely to cause no end of mayhem, misery, death, despair, pain, and suffering. Um, as does germ warfare research. The, the scientists carrying that out have no, I suppose they might argue they are they are strengthening their country's defences against warfare from the, the hated enemy. But should their inventions ever be released upon the public or upon armies, rival foreign armies in warfare, then the consequences are beyond horrific. So science is not all this kind of noble-minded, squeaky clean, let's help humanity. Um, approach that is often vaunted in films and TV shows, you get scientists who are engaged in horrific forms of research. Uh, would women engage in horrific forms of research? Obviously, none of us would be allowed to go into a germ warfare laboratory, but I would put money on it that if anybody ever did go into a germ warfare laboratory, you'd find women working there just as much as you find men working there. Whether it's equal numbers or, or, or different ratios, I don't know, but um, there are going to be women who will take the money and run and not think too much about the results of the research they've conducted as to how they'll be used, just as you'll find male scientists who do the same. Or is it the case that they are the minority of women researchers who do that, and actually the vast majority of women researchers would never want to engage in such horrendous forms of research. But equally, could we say that of men? Are the vast majority of male researchers disinclined to engage in such horrible forms of research? And the ones who do engage in it are a tiny minority of the overall academic community, scientific community. Discuss. Okay, Wiley. Um, in the early 2000s puts forward this idea that there are four major factors involved in feminist research. Some of these you could say are involved in just research generally and some of them are maybe a bit more specific to circumstance or not, sorry, not circumstance to ideology. So the first of the four key factors and that's instantly why there is a question mark there after feminist research in the title is whether all of these are specifically feminist or whether they're more general. At least some of them are more general. First one, relevance. And at one level this is, is this subject under study relevant to women? If it's not, it's not feminist research. So someone who comes as a committed feminist researcher in whatever scientific discipline it happens to be would want to study subjects that are specifically relevant to women if they're a second wave feminist or if they're third wave feminist that go down this much looser notion that there are other lots of other groups of people who are in some way or another oppressed by the gender structure who yeah. are um, obviously that is a peculiarly feminist approach but i suppose you could say all research is deemed to be relevant to somebody somewhere in some yeah, otherwise what if it's irrelevant why do it experiential grounding suggests that ideas for research what to research in the first place um, what to put in a grant application for all that sort of thing should build out stem from the experiences the lived real life experiences of women and again if you're third wave of members of these other groups as well and what it is like to actually be a woman or a member of one of these other groups with the aim of empowerment which shades into the accountability issue with the aim of liberating setting free again going back to Harding's argument there about emancipation that it should reflect real life experiences of um, downtrodden groups rather than theoretical abstract airy fairy notions the accountability and again you could say is, is accountability particularly relevant to any kind of research not just feminist research um, should not demean exploit abuse the people being studied uh, which can be a curious one because if you engaged in research on a group and you came to some rather negative conclusions about that group 
does this accountability suggest you should not publish what you have found? Does it in effect silence people from saying anything untoward? Because you can't guarantee that if, if you conduct um, a research project, go out and interview a bunch of people, you can't guarantee you're going to leave the research and, and have, you know, once you've finished analysing it and everything, you're going to leave that research with glowingly positive opinions of the people you've researched. You might leave it with quite negative opinions of the people you research. So there is an ambiguity here in which should you either not say anything because that would be considered demeaning or maybe not even study such a group in the first place if you thought there was a possibility that you might come away with some negative opinion of that group. So football hooligans, for example, if you want, should you go and study football hooligans because you might find yourself drawing unflattering opinions about the football hooligans by the end of it? Should you not go and study far-right neo-Nazi groups because you might end up saying something a bit rude about them by the end of it? Should you only study groups you can talk about in a very positive, upbeat way? Debatable one. Or would it be the case that if you did want to go and study one of those groups, well, it wouldn't class as feminist research? And I suppose if you're not a feminist, you might say, well, so what? But if you are a feminist, would that put you in a double bind where you might want to study the group, but who you can't study the group? I don't know. Possibly. Um, and ideally, going back to accountability, um, the results of the research should empower or emancipate the people under study. Which would be an awkward one if you were studying neo Nazis. How are you going to empower neo Would you want to empower neo Nazis? I suppose you could argue you might want to emancipate them from their own politics and liberate them to a more know, liberal, mainstream political point of view or something like that, perhaps. Uh, well, finally, um, from Wiley's point of view, reflexivity, uh, which we've talked about many, many times before. Uh, this idea that there is no such thing as neutrality, back to Harding's argument and standpoint theory, and that what we should aspire to rather than neutrality is owning our value systems, being upfront, being public about it, having a written reflexive system and report saying, this is, this is the axe I have to grind, this is where I come from, this is my lived experience, which relates directly to the subject at hand, this is me, rather than trying to act as if we are some kind of robot-like neutral presence. We're not. And it should be understood from that point of view. Uh, now, just to get a little bit philosophical and abstract, I'd like to shove a little bit of philosophy into the lectures where possible, but not too much. Um, Martin Buber, a German theologian, developed uh, an idea set of beliefs which are based in no small part on the much earlier ideas proposed by Heidegger and by Descartes and by a couple of other people. But um, Buber's approach seems to have caught on quite strongly, not only within theology, but it's um, seeped out of theology into a lot of other academic subjects as well. Um, I'll try and keep the theology to a minimum because whilst it fascinates me, I know it probably bores half of you to death. Um, the Ich Du, that's German, I say Martin Buber was German, he wrote in German, the translations are in the bracket. Uh, so Ich Du, I, You, or sometimes it's translated in older books as I, Thou. The theological element is that Buber argues worshippers should try to have this relationship, the I, You relationship with God, but he also says between humans as well. And so we'll put the relationship to God to one side and focus on the relationship between humans for the sake of this lecture. Although the other bit, as I say, I find fascinating. But anyway, um, what's an IU relationship with another human being? I am a human. I am a person. I have emotions, feelings, hopes, dreams, fears, worries, aspirations, all sorts of things. I'm, I'm a rounded being in the amount of cake I eat. I'm getting more rounded by the moment. I know that I am a rounded being. I expect other people to treat me as a human being. And so, 
if I have a positive approach to life, when I meet other human beings in the flesh or via the internet or whatever method I am meeting other human beings through, I acknowledge that they are human beings, that they also have their hopes and fears and loves and hates and aspirations and all of that. And I try to treat them <coughs> as a fully rounded person. I try to. Don't always succeed, but I try to. And we should do that with everyone. So even if it's only the uh, 30 seconds you spend standing at the cash till in the supermarket, the, the person on the cash till, the cashier, is a human being. Even if you, that's the, the, your sole contact with them is the 30 seconds you stood there. Nonetheless, you should regard them as a human being. Smile at them, say hello, chat about the weather or whatever, um, make eye contact, all that palaver. They're a human, you're a human. If we all did that, the world would be a smashing and lovely place. And we wouldn't go around being vile to each other. However, we know that the world is not a smashing lovely place and that there are plenty of people who go around being vile to each other. Why are they vile to each other? Well, Buber says it's because they have an if s i it relationship. What is that? Well, the I side is exactly the same as it was for the previous one. I'm a human being, I know I am. However, however, do I know that you are a human being? No, I don't. I just see you as a lump of meat. You're a, a thing there. So the cashier is not a person. They're just a thing. They sit behind a cash desk. They perform a task. It may as well be done by a robot for the worker. And I don't smile at them. I don't say hello to them. I don't give a flying donut about what their name is, whether they're married, have kids, single, miserable, whatever the hell they are. I don't care. No interest in them. I just want them to do their job and then forget about them. And in the 30 seconds experience of two human beings meeting up, 30 seconds is 30 seconds, more of it. Um, however, supposing this is somebody I spend more than 30 seconds with. This could be, I could be the boss and they could be my employee or vice versa. We see each other on a daily basis for a prolonged period of time. It could be a next door neighbor. It could be a student teacher in either direction. All, all sorts of situations you can think of in which even though you spend a prolonged period of time with that other person, you still don't see them as a person. They're just a name, a number, a minion. They do whatever it is they do. You don't know anything about them. You don't really care about them. You don't bother to find out what kind of life they have. You, you, as I say, it's not just the cashier where you don't care if they're married with kids or single or childless or whatever the hell they are. You, even with these people you spend prolonged periods of time with, you just don't care about the details of their life. They are there to serve a function. As long as they do the function, beyond that, you don't much care about them. So you don't ask those kinds of questions about them. You don't attempt to get friendly with them. You don't attempt to get on side with them. If they're having a, you know, they're unwell or having a bad day for that, any one of a thousand reasons, and they're not performing the function they're meant to perform, you. You don't care why, all you care about is that the function is not being performed and that's annoying. And you get angry or, or whatever you get. The, the reasons why they're not up to par are neither here nor there. You don't know what they are, you don't care what they are, you don't want to know what they are. You just want this thing, this it, to do its job. And we could argue this is probably the attitude, as much as we can ever know these things, that slave owners, whether on plantations in Alabama or all the way back to ancient Rome or ancient Egypt or wherever, that slave owners would have had to their slaves. The slave is just a thing and it, it does a job. And in a sense, it's a bit like the relationship you might have to a fridge or a washing machine. Do you even really have a relationship with a fridge or a washing machine? It does a job. If the washing machine breaks down and stops doing its job, well, you might pay a bit of money to get it repaired or you might just throw the damn thing out and buy another one. Do you sit there thinking, oh, oh I've thrown my washing machine on the scrap heap. I hope my washing machine isn't sad and upset that it is sitting on a scrap heap. Of course you don't know anything like that. And would anyone in the days of slavery, although it still, I suppose still are kind of in the days of slavery, still goes on and you know, I'm illegally. Would anyone sit there and think, well, 
my sleeve's too old to do the job, therefore I've, I've sacked them and chucked them out of the house. Do they sit there worrying and think, oh, that poor sleeve, is he starving to death? Um, is, is he cold and, and frightened sitting on the streets? Would, would they give a thought to that? I suppose some sleeve owners might, but probably a lot of them didn't. They, they would give no more thought to the sleeve than you or I would give to the washing machine or the fridge. They're just there to do a job, that's it. They're not people, they're things. And it's that attitude, the, the treatment of others as things rather than as people, that Buber argues is the bedrock of most human misery. Uh, obviously, there are other forms of human misery caused by earthquakes and floods and such like. But the, the endless, endless acts of cruelty and nastiness and spite, all the way from just snotty comments at one end to murder and torture and God knows what else at the other end, all of that depends on this kind of snotty attitude that that other human being is just a thing. They're not a person, they're an it. Other people, just very briefly, have argued that this attitude can be understood in a broader ethical context as not only applying to relationships between humans, but also applying to relationships between human and non-human. So the way we respond to cats and dogs and horses and what have you. So if, if you've got a, a dog or a cat, some other kind of pet you dote upon, then you probably have an I-U relationship with a pet. You engage with the pet, you may refer to the pet as always very happy today or, or I, I think she's hungry. That's an I-U relationship rather than it's hungry, it doesn't look well, which is an I-it relationship. Other people have that very kind of distant relationship to the, the non-human. Um, as we move further and further into the 21st century, there are technosophists who argue we'll probably be having these debates around how we relate to robots in the not too distant future. Is the robot a person or is the robot an, an it, a thing? Um, there are all sorts of contexts in which we might have these discussions and debates. Um, arguably, there are also some people who don't have a sense of themselves as an I, who have a sense of themselves as an it. They, they feel themselves to be a thing rather than feel themselves to be a person. So it, it, it can work in different directions than just the, the directions that Huber has laid out here. Um, what's the point of all this philosophy? Well, it's the bedrock of this notion of subject-object relations, which has been in existence for quite a while. So people like Descartes and Heidegger and so on. Um, Freud really brought it forward into the social sciences um, through Freudian theory and notions of object relations which is, is, a, is much more complex than what I've just laid out here, but just to flag it up as a, a concept you might come across. So the subject is, is the person, is the, the I. In a relationship, one person looks at and sees the other person. The looker, the watcher, is the I, is the subject. The person being looked at, being watched, is the object. And if it's a negatively constructed relationship, that object is, is more in the it category than the you category, the thing being looked at. Uh, this is where Mulvey developed her argument back in the 70s around the male gaze, which still does the rounds. There are plenty of critics of the male gaze these days, but it is quite a persistent theory um, and popularly quoted in um, magazines and what have you, that the male is the subject, the looker, and the female on the screen, the woman on the screen, the actress or, or singer or model or whatever she is, is the object, the thing being looked at, and is treated as a thing, not as a fully rounded person. Um, give you a, a slightly graphic example of this. Um, pornography, quite a few feminists, and, they, and indeed some non-feminist um, researchers have argued, it requires a high level of object, let's start that again, objectification. And objectification obviously stems from the word object. 
So what is objective engagement? You look at the screen, let's say it's a porn film rather than a, a magazine or something like that. Somebody is watching a porn film and they look at the screen and they see the men and the women on the screen. Do they sit there and think, oh, I wonder what their name is. Oh, I wonder what their favorite ice cream is. Oh, I wonder what books they like reading. Of course they don't think any of that. What they do is they sit there and they look at them and think, oh, look at the size of this or that part of that person's anatomy. And, and they just treat them as meat. It's a meat market. Um, there, there's no notion or interest in the humanity of the, what, what do you call them, actors, performers, whatever the appropriate term would be for someone starring in a porn film. Um, let alone any notion of whether they, when they're going ooh, ooh, ah, ah, are they really enjoying this or are they faking it? Um, yeah, are, are they doing this because this is their ideal career? Or are they doing this because they're really desperate for money and they couldn't find any other way of earning the money? At least not in the time frame required. Um, there, there's no thought about any of that. But if you compare it to, say, acting in the more usual sense of the word, a lot of people do, tell, not, not every single actor on the screen receives this attention, but a lot of actors will find that the audience watching them do take an interest, that they, they come to really like that actor, and they don't just see them as a, a lump of meat moving around reciting words. They, they want to know, are they married? Do they have kids? Are they gay? Are they straight? And then they, they kind of read about them, and they look at autobiographies and biographies, and they become a bit of a fan, and they take an interest in that actor as a person and follow them in different roles in different films or stage plays or whatever it is. Um, and that they are conscious that that actor is not just a lump of meat moving around performing a function, that they are a person, a rounded person. And it becomes the kind of difference between, let's say, you, you hire a plumber and they turn up at your house to fix your leaky tap or whatever the hell it is, do you offer them a cup of tea? Something as dead simple as that, as very basic as that, you are acknowledging that this is a human being and human beings get thirsty. They might be thirsty, they might want a five minute pause in their busy day of rushing around to just sit, have a cup of tea, and maybe while they're having their cup of tea, you have one as well, and you talk about the weather or what was on TV last night or whatever old rubbish you can talk about. That is an acknowledgement of that person's humanity, that they are not just some lump of meat who turns up, fixes taps, and goes away again, that that is a person. So something as simple as just offering a cup of tea is a, an acknowledgement, terribly British acknowledgement, of someone's humanity. If they turn up and you don't offer them anything, you say, hey, there's the tap, get on with it, get out as soon as you're done. That's treating them as an it, a thing. A, a service, a function, not a person. Simple as that. Where does this tip into academic research and knowledge? You're, you're a sociologist, you're going along, you're interviewing a bunch of people, or surveying them or doing whatever it is that you're doing with them. Are these people? Or are they subject? Are they participants? Are they things to be studied? How would that pan out in a practical sense? Well, do you take an interest in them as people outside of the research? Do you do you follow up with them to say, well, I've, I've finished the research now. Would you like to see a copy of this interview we did? Would you like this? Would you like that? Or as soon as it's over and done with, do you forget they even existed in the first place? You've got what you wanted out of them, job done, forget about them, move on. So it's, it's how you treat the people who form the, the object of your study. And part of this, as per the quote there from Harding about pl placing people in the same critical plane as the objects of knowledge, um, is to understand that there is a, a two-way street between you as the person, the observer engaging in research, and the people that you are observing, that you are looking at, the objects of your research. They have knowledge, you're seeking to acquire that knowledge by asking them questions in an interview or a survey or getting them to perform some function that you can then measure and monitor. But they also have interests in you. 
which is why we had briefs and debriefs, a chance for them to ask you questions as well as you to ask them questions. So it, it, there is a kind of a two-way street in engagement and Harding wants to emphasize the importance of the two-way street and that too often in a lot of research, it's very perfunctory. And you'll know this from your own experience of doing experiments and you have that awkward bit at the end where the lecturer says, does anyone have any questions? And you're stood at the front as a person conducting the experiment and you're hoping no one will ask you anything. So you can sit down, it's over and done with, gone. And you breathe a sigh of relief. That's the sort of approach to paid professional research that Harding wants to get shot of. So that there is an engagement with people as people. Not just, I've got the information right, go away. Which is a more kind of objectifying relationship. Now, Sue Ross's approach will blast to me very quickly because this is getting rather overly long lecture. Um, and it's not, not massively relevant to this stage in your studies, but it's something you might come back to in third year in terms of your dissertation, some elements of this at any rate, you might revisit, at least if you are a feminist, you might revisit, if you're not, then you probably won't. <laughs> um, just to flag these six impacts that Rosa argues feminism has had on science, and this is science in a very broad sense of incorporating 101 different scientific subjects, not just on sociology. So pedagogical transformation in science, um, pedagogy is the way something is taught, the way it's learnt, studied, taught, passed on in schools and colleges and universities and what have you. So she says that feminism has changed the way that science is taught in schools. Um, the curricular transformation is the actual topics on the curriculum that are being taught. So which aspects of science, which subjects within science get taught? And therefore, if you compare the subjects taught to school kids 100 years ago to the subjects taught to school kids today, then there's change, it's different, there are updates, movements. Some of that updating has come about because of new technologies and so forth. But Rosa says it's also some of those changes have come about because of feminism has helped to change the very topics within science that get taught on the curriculum. An example of which is the third one there, the attention to the history of women in science. So there have been female scientists since ancient times, you go back to ancient Greece, ancient Egypt and so on, they had female scientists back then. But 100 years ago, how many kids sitting in a classroom in 1920 or 1910 or 1870 would have been taught about famous women scientists. Not many, if any, famous women scientists would have been mentioned. Um, but these days, obviously, you have things like Black History Month and Women's History Month and all this sort of thing, in which there are periods in the year where particular focus is given to not only scientists, but also all sorts of other people, sports people and actors and, and what, politicians and what have you who come from a particular demographic. And so kids today in 2020 are much more likely to learn about famous female scientists than kids in 1920 were. Our current status of women in science, that's about how many women are employed in a laboratory, in a research institute, in universities teaching science, in schools teaching science, etc. So feminism has had a big impact on getting more women into STEM and pushing grant funding for STEM, female-oriented STEM projects and so on. Feminist critique of science is the kind of things we've been talking about so far, um, where feminists have said, oh, well, this bit of, of the scientific community needs changing, that bit of the scientific theory needs changing, and have brought in a critique and suggested ways of improvement, ways of change, ways of development within science. Finally, th feminist theory of science is a bit too broad an area for us to touch on here, but it's the idea that there are, oh, we kind of had touched on it a little bit, the idea that there are um, approaches to science that fit within a feminist context, which is both in terms of this idea of there being female values, female approaches, female attitudes, but also the emancipatory element that um, people like Donna Haraway, and Sandra Harding have mentioned 
uh, as being important that science be used. Part of the theory of science is what you do with science afterwards, as well as how you conduct science, uh, what you do with the results, and part of that is the emancipatory argument. Okay, moving on to queer methodologies and putting the feminist uh, methodologies to one side. So queer methodologies stems from the whole discipline of queer theory, which really came into prominence in the 90s and the 2000s. I say prominence, I mean, it's still a relatively minority thing, but it became a phenomenon in those decades. And ideas from queer theory have had quite an impact on certainly sociology, if, if not quite so much other sciences. Um, queer theory started out as being interested in, in LGBT people, but it has now broadened its remit to a wider array. Um, and taking an interest in any group demographic that is a minority, uh, particularly a disenfranchised or sidelined minority. So it's no longer exclusively um, sexual and gender minorities, it's known, so thinking about other types of minorities as well, come under the remit of queer theory. So even though the word queer obviously has certain associations, um, it's, it's broadened, and part of the reason why it's called queer theory and not LGBT theory is the idea that queer means strange, or at least that's, that's going back to the 1920s, people say, oh, that's queer, they meant something was strange. And so this is the study of the strange, the peculiar, the odd, those who are dis deemed to be marginalised and weird and odd by mainstream society. Are there methodologies which are of use in studying these minorities? That's an element of queer theory. Uh, we'll get onto that to answer that question in a second. Um, before we get onto that question, there is also the degree to which the, the very nature of queer theory has had an impact on how studies are carried out in the first place. Now, queer theory has increasingly, over its very short lifespan, in, uh, rejected notions of essentialism. So essentialism goes back to issues around gender, issues around sexuality, and other things as well that um, someone is born female or they're born male, not just in the biological sense, but in the sense of having that as a, an identity, the, 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 their own sense of their masculinity, their own sense of their femininity. So rather than saying that gender is learnt, is socially constructed and therefore changeable, it's more the argument that there is something innate to being a woman that men will not get and vice versa an argument advanced, for example, by Julian Grit, as one of the more famous names in the field. Um, queer theory increasingly rejects that, both about gender, but also about sexuality. So the, the essentialist argument is that someone is born gay, or they're born straight, or they're born bisexual, or what have you, rather than that they suddenly turn gay at some point in their life, or they suddenly turn heterosexual at some point in their life. Um, and that sexuality is not changeable. So you can't make someone change from being gay to straight or straight to gay. They are what they are. It is essential to their experience, to their biology, to their, their life. Queer theory rejects that as well in favour of gender and sexual fluidity. This notion that rather than there being boxes, there's a gay box, a straight box, a bisexual box, a, man, a male box, a female box. Um, that there are not boxes into which you can neatly fit people, that these boxes are just dreamt up by society and used as a form of control. It's, it's a notion very much influenced by Foucault and his ideas around the biopower and the wish to control people. Um, the idea that the authorities within society like keeping people manageable and measurable. And there's an element of this which also goes back to Max Weber and the idea around the obsessions with bureaucracy of monitoring and measuring and categorizing people as a form of social control. Uh, and so queer theorists reject that and they say you can um, have fluid sexuality. So you can have somebody who says, on Monday that they identify as a man, and by Wednesday they're identifying as a woman, and by Friday they're identifying as gender neutral. And likewise, you could have somebody who goes from identifying as, as gay on a Monday, straight on a Friday, and um, 
bottom section on the Sunday. Um, none of that matters because identity is not fixed and rigid and consistent over a lifespan. It chops, it changes, it moves, and it's a very subjective experience rather than an objective experience. And it's all about deconstructing notions of gender and notions of uh, sexuality and so forth, which does mean that getting a grip on these things can feel like nailing jelly to a wall. Hence the photograph. Um, the more you try to define something, the more queer theory tries to undefine it, which some people find profoundly annoying and other people actually find dangerous and offensive because they argue it undermines the very advances that feminism has achieved for women and that the, the whole gay rights movement has achieved for um, the LGBT community and so forth. So there is a strong political dimension both for and against queer theory. Um, as a slight aside to leave you to mull on before we go on to the next bit, um, queer theory is very much rooted in conflict theory, which itself is rooted in Marxism. And that for Marx, the big conflict in society was between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have not, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Um, that went uh, moved as a concept conflict theory into feminism. And that developed into, um, not every feminist goes along with this, I should say, but it is a widespread idea amongst many, many feminists that there is a fundament, fundamental conflict between men and women, between patriarchy and, um, well, for the second wave, womanhood, for the third wave, a whole raft of other minority groups as well. And so it's conflict theory as fights between groups which have power and groups which don't have anywhere near as much power has now become part of queer theory. So sort of feuds between not only the genders, but between different sexual identity interest groups and so on. Question I want to leave you to mull over, and I'm going to be as annoying as I always am and not give you an answer to this, but I'm asking to mull over it, is whether conflict theory in any of its shapes, forms and variety is as it claims to be when it sets out uncovering and revealing existing conflicts in society or all of these decades on is it can actually creating conflict by convincing people through this process of education dare i say indoctrination that these are accepted truths which cannot be challenged and we must just say yes there is conflict between men and women Yes, there is conflict between rich and poor. Yes, there is conflict between gay and straight, between ethnic groups, between this, between that, between the other. As unchallenged received wisdoms, the more people are convinced that there are conflicts, does this actually create the conflict rather than destroy the conflict? So does it become a self-perpetuating ideology that creates the very thing it claims to study? Or am I being unduly cynical? Interesting to your point of view. So how does this impact on things like methods and methodologies? Well, one of the problems is this very issue of chucking out the boxes of identity. A lot of research, particularly quantitative, but also to an extent qualitative, is dependent on nominative categories, which you will instantaneously remember means putting people in boxes. So you, can, you start your research by saying, are you male or female? Or indeed somewhere in the middle. Um, uh, what's your ethnic identity? What's your religion? What's this? What's that? And you've got a set of boxes and you tick those boxes as to where these people sit. If those boxes are rejected, how do you engage in that research? Let's say Joe Bloggs wants to conduct some research on um, how, oh, I don't know, how gay men um experience loneliness that's that's a research project i came across a few weeks ago how do gay men experience loneliness and let's that, say it's i can't remember the name of the actual person who's engaging in that research so we call them joe blogs um if you're an essentialist you kind of well you, you just go out you find some gay men you talk to them about loneliness and you write it out job done 
But if you're coming down the queer theory route and notions of gay and straight are out the window anyway, what action, how are you going to find gay men to study? Because are there even such things as gay men? Are there men who at the moment identify as gay? Okay, yeah, so you take that attitude and you go and find someone, do you identify as gay today? And they go, oh, yes, today I identify as gay. And then you ask them your questions and you, you conduct the study accordingly. But what if tomorrow they don't identify as gay? What if tomorrow they identify as straight or bisexual or asexual or some other thing? Does that mean your study is then therefore invalid? Because in asking them those questions, all they did was give you an insight into their experiences in that split second of time when they had that identity, but that identity is so fluid, it's gone out the window a day later to be replaced by a different identity. So how, how do you engage in research when trying to identify the people you want to research is like nailing jelly to a wall? It begs questions of the validity of the information gained if it's gained about a category of people when that category may chop and change and move and flow all over the place and they might not be in that category anymore even by the time you finish typing up your report that's the only time anyone's actually read it becomes difficult um other people and you've got a couple of names listed there Bolschdorf, Plummer, Veloci say that certain forms of method are quite useful when um, engaging in research with people in these various different minority gender and sexuality groups within queer theory. So ethnographies are very important, autoethnographies are very important, textual linguistic analysis are very important. Um, they can of course be used with all sorts of other demographics as well, but perhaps no one there. That's about all we're going to say on queer research methodologies at the moment, largely because there's so much hot air generated within and between people studying these things that they can't seem to agree on the damn thing anyway to give you any really more definitive um, ideas to run with than just the vague notions we've had at the moment. This takes us on to Hale who picks up on ideas again from um, Harding and Haraway and a variety of others talking about activism research and what it is and how we understand activism research. And this possibly is something you might be interested in for dissertation, um, perhaps. So what, what is it in the first place? Well, Hale's definition, which um, fits well with most other people's definition of, of activism research, is that it's research focused on issues such as inequality and oppression and, and violence. Um, I should point out that the definition of violence here is incredibly broad. So don't just think of violence as people punching each other. It's that very loose 21st century definition of violence where even a word or a look can be classed as violence these days. Um, it's a definition so loose personally, I find it deeply unhelpful and actually undermining the seriousness of physical violence. But no, that, that's just my personal hobbies. So let, let's go with the inequality oppression bits for a moment. So you find a group that is oppressed, is in a very um, sidelined, marginalized position in society and conduct research not on that group, but with that group. And this is going back to these subject relations, so, sorry, subject object relations, uh, Martin Buber and the whole notion that You've, you've got to keep front and cent central that the people being studied are people. They're not just objects, things to be studied, they're actual people, and it's a two-way street, like we were saying before. Um, so the whole of the research from the, the moment when you as a researcher sit down and think, oh, I'd like to study so-and-so bunch of people, all the way through to the carrying out of the experiment and the or research interviews, whatever it may be, and the writing it up and the publishing of the report and the, the mailing it out to people. All of that is engaged with, not on, but with the oppressed, um, marginalised group in question. So they are full participants in the research process. It's not just you, the clever academic, carrying out research on them while they sit there like lemons. 
they are everyone involved in this is is an active participant in it which can raise some some issues in and of itself in that how you identify who the relevant members of this suppressed minority group are to talk to in the first place you want to talk to um, lesbians for example there's a lot of lesbians in the world which lesbians do you talk to because they're not all going to have the same point of view the same outlooks the same views and experiences so do you just talk to them the first lesbian you you fall across or the, the one that lives closest to you or, or do you hunt out lesbians from much further afield to talk to and there's all sorts of issues in how you make contact with people particularly if they're from a group that might be a bit nervous about being identified or being known um, who is representative of a group who is not representative of a group and that brings up issues around gatekeeping and all sorts of other palavras so this is not quite clear-cut as it i might have made it sound it's an involved process um, the aim of activism research is going back to what harding was saying in that quote earlier on the aim is to emancipate people so the research has to be useful to the people being researched it has to improve their lot in life and if you've studied 10 people it doesn't mean only those 10 people get their lot improved in life rather it means that that category that demographic of people in general is improved as a result of your research not the whole world over because that's ludicrous to aim for that level of impact but it, it, it your research has a ripple effect that improves people's lot in life empowers them emancipates them makes them better off in some way how you help achieve power that's a highly debatable one in and of itself but it's something that activism research sets out to do um, to empower <coughs> those being studied and just to return to the bit about the organized collective having found a bunch of people you want to talk to for this research and who want to talk to you in exchange um, the assumption is that they are somehow organized with each other in other words you haven't just found five random isolated people to talk to you found five people who are part of a network who are interconnected organized focused campaigning for change uh, which might mean that the people you're talking to are actually quite unrepresentative if we're being honest here um, pick a minority group a perceived sideline minority and how many of the people in that group will be out waving banners on protest marches and how many more will be wanting to have a nice quiet stable life rather than tear down society and rebuild it in the vision of their their brave new world uh, within most groups a lot of groups you're going to find that the the firebrands for social change are a tiny minority within a much larger group of people who really would much sooner have a quiet life and just get on with it they want their their lot improved but in a quiet way rather than a loud shouty streaming way there is an issue there so some of the challenges involved in this um, what if and this is a, something we've flagged up earlier what if you conduct your research you get to the end of your research and the answer to the problems you were looking at is not quite the answer you were hoping to hear it's not the liberating emancipating huggy cuddly smashing reaffirming answer you were wanting for what if the answer to the problem posed is not a nice answer there's a bit of a slap in the face to the people who have helped within this activist research what do you do do you just ignore it ditch it spin doctor it to try and make it sound better than it is or do you do what um previous generations of non-activist scientists have done and just say well this is what i found like it or lump it this is the answer if you don't like it tough luck that's the answer what do you do that um 
There's a strong idealistic tradition of what's referred to as pure science, knowledge for the sake of knowledge, not knowledge because it's useful, because it will do this, because it will do that, but just knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Activism research isn't interested in knowledge for the sake of knowledge. It's interested in useful knowledge. It is applied science. That's not a problem in and of itself. It's just worth knowing that this is applied science. Let's find information that's useful for changing society rather than just find information that we can put in a book and stick on the shelf and doesn't really do much of anything. But, you know, knowledge is knowledge. And it's all terribly idealistic. Um, the reflexivity issue we've touched upon, but to, to return to this, um, the researcher is a participant alongside the people being interviewed or surveyed or whatever is, method is being used. Um, and therefore, the interviewer is present as a real person. They're an engaged person. That, that If they're not a member of the oppressed minority themselves, they are at least on site with the oppressed minority, wanting to use this research to improve their lot in the world. So they are a firebrand themselves. They are kind of politically motivated. Now, how far does that has to have to extend? For example, let's say it's, 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 we're looking at a, a large scale research project with funding grant money and the, the lead researcher has five research assistants, for argument's sake. Should those five research assistants also share the same ideology? What if some of them are just doing a job? They want the money, they don't really give a toss about the politics, they'll just carry out the job they're given to carry out, cash their paycheck, end of. Is that acceptable within activist, activist research? Almost every single person is singing from the same hymn sheet, every single person sharing the same politics and ideology, which itself is difficult because within any political movement, you're going to get shades of opinion and disagreements. How much disagreement, how much variety of opinion can uh, a, a given activist research project cope with before it starts to fall apart? and pull in different directions. Not an easy question to answer. Hale goes on to say there are various steps involved. Um, start of the step, you formulate your questions, you set your objectives, well this you should do with the people you are studying, rather than just sitting in your armchair at home all quiet by yourself and, and developing those ideas. So you go out, you talk to the community you want to study, you say what do you think the aim should be, what do you think the objectives should be, let's all get together and talk about this. So it's a shared process. The data collection when you're out conducting the interviews or the surveys or whatever it is, um, that again should be using methods that the group under study have consented to, have agreed with, have recommended as sensible ones to use for answering the question posed, um, for engaging with that type of a person. And again, back to this idea that people can be put into recognizable types open to debate, um, and that they are therefore participating. Again, it's a shared process. It's not just saying, I'm the clever scientist. This is what we're doing. You go along with it. It's it's an engagement, two-way straight. The interpretation and the analysis, again, you have your ideas as a researcher, but you, you run those ideas past the people you have studied. So far from saying, right, I've finished the interview, you can go away now. They still hang around after the interview. So you write up your report, you say, oh, I've coded this interview. These are the codes I've come up with. Would you like to read your own interviews and tell me if you agree with those codes or disagree with them or want to suggest a, a different code I hadn't thought of? And so the analysis of the data is, again, through engagement rather than just clever scientists telling other people what the answers are. The dissemination of the data, that's, that's it's all published, it's written, it's typed up, it's done, it goes out in a journal or a book or whatever it goes out in, has to be done in engagement again with the people studied. So they get to see, um, see the results themselves, they get copies of the information and they can say, oh, I, I would like copies to be sent to so-and-so place, to so-and-so person. And part of who that information is disseminated to is influenced by this desire to change social systems. So it is sending the information to people in power. Um, the Quakers talk about speaking out to power to say that you have the authority, the clout to change this situation. You need to read this information, this research and act on it. 
and that becomes part and parcel of the whole thing as well. Um, the validation process, most academic research is validated through peer review. Other clever academics read it and say that's really good or that's a little of rubbish or whatever they're going to say about it. That can still go on in activism research. However, there is another factor which Stokes brings in, this notion of use-oriented basic research. Activism research is conducted to have an impact, to change laws or social structures or whatever it might be, to improve the lot of the oppressed minority that's been studied. So if at the end of the research, it's all written up, it's in books and journals and whatnot, if at the end of all of that, nothing happens, the lot of the minority in question stays just as bad as ever it was, or maybe even gets worse, um, then the activism research has failed and is invalid. Because part of the validation of the research for Hale, for Stokes, or various other people, is that some desirable change is brought about in society as a result of the research. People's lot is improved. Whether it's improved to quite the extent hoped for or not, I suppose, is a moot point, but it is improved at least to some extent. Someone benefits from the knowledge presented in the book or the journal, or the paper, that knowledge is useful. It does beg the question, to whom should that knowledge be useful? But that's it, that's another issue in and of itself. Those are the steps flowed through. Okay, enough activism research, enough queer theory, enough feminism. You might want to get yourself a very strong coffee by this juncture and pause the video. And then replay. And we'll go on to talk briefly about the layout of the second assignment, the interview one. It's for those of you who did the psychology methodologies before Christmas, it's the same layout that you used for the second assignment there. But I appreciate not everyone was in that module. So for the benefit of those of you who weren't in that module. Words at most, which summarizes what the point of your research is now. Bear in mind an abstract. When you go into a library, you pick up a research project, a journal, something of that sort. You read the abstract, there should be enough information in the abstract that enables you, the reader, to decide, is it worth your time reading the rest of it? Is it giving you the kind of information you're interested in finding out about or not? So by the time someone has read the abstract, they should either think, yay, this is really relevant to me, and read the rest of it, or they should think, no, this isn't what I'm looking for, and put it up on the shelf. That's what your abstract is there to do. From there, you move into a short introduction, a couple of hundred words at most, summarizing what the point of this research is, these interviews, um, what, it, what it's about, and then you flow into your lit review, where you are citing past research by other people on this particular topic. Now, the topics in question are either religion or advertising or dieting. Now, don't just put in any old research about dieting or about religion, about advertising. Put in research that is specific to the angles that interest you. And this is an individual thing. It is interest you because obviously you're in groups. So what interests you, the person listening to, to me wittering at you, need not interest other members of your group. You can take your own stance on this. That doesn't have to be shared by the other people in the group because it's your analysis of the interviews, not their analysis of the interviews. So keep your lit review specific to things that, that you intend to um, apply to the interviews, the theories, ideas, notions that you intend to apply to the interviews. Then you end your lit review section with a statement of some aims, or if you prefer to call them research questions. So that two is quite sufficient, three at the push, don't go beyond, beyond three. You don't have the word count for that. So these are questions, if you get that, phrase it as questions, the aim is to answer this. Each bullet point, each question should be one question. So don't get in the habit of kind of rolling four questions into one big long question. One short question, which you can and will answer by the end of the assignment. If you can't answer it, don't even ask it in the first place. 
so something you can answer by the end of the assignment. If you're stuck for what those aims and questions could be, email me and we'll talk about it. Or we'll, we'll do a, a chat room thing in the gym. Do it that way. Your methodology section, fairly standard forward methodology here for quantitative methods. Short research design subsection. In this case, it's an interview design. You could cite to someone who quotes why interviews are useful for getting you rich, deep information, blah, blah, all that sort of thing. Um, short participants recruitment section recruitment is just sampling. So you had, what was it, three people you interviewed? You said there's so many men, so many women, the age range was blah, blah, blah. And what was the recruitment process? Well, each person in your group went out and found someone. So this is a form of um, direct recruitment of people you know. I talk about that as a sampling method. Um, what are the strengths and, and disadvantages of that as a sampling method? Um, one of the disadvantages we'll move on to momentarily in terms of acquiescence, but we'll get to that momentarily. Data collection. You conducted a coding approach, you coded the interviews and thematically analysed them, so you, you organised your codes into a set of themes, and that's where you put your table in with your couple of few themes in it. Which colours have you used? What do those colours represent? How often have those colours cropped up in the process of analysing your three interviews? Data analysis, you can put the table in there, and start to explain some of, of um, what these key themes are. Um, and, oh, I should also mention you can cite Braun and Clark for your data collection bit. Uh, you followed the six steps that Braun and Clark recommend for thematic analysis. Chuck that in. The ethics section, you guarantee anonymity to the interviewees. No name, no pack drill. Um, did any of them talk about possibly upsetting issues? Oops. Maybe you made a conscious effort not to ask any upsetting questions, perhaps. Um, or if they did get upset, then were you able to recommend them on to some a counsellor or a charitable support telephone line, something of that nature, that they could turn to to get a bit of emotional support if they had re recollected some issue in the interview that upset them? You can factor those in as your ethics as well. Um, reflexivity, that's where you talk about yourself a little bit. So. Have you been on a diet? Have you succumbed to buying junk off the TV adverts that you then regretted? Are you yourself religious or were at some point in your life, if not currently religious? Um, so you, you start to talk about how your own experience relates to your interest in the subject. And when you set your questions to ask these people, um, did the questions you come up with reflect things that you were particularly interested in that you particularly wanted to know? So again, you bring your own reflexivity. You as an individual, what's your axe to grind? What's your particular interest? So if you've decided to analyse this from a feminist viewpoint, a Marxist viewpoint, a queer theory viewpoint, and any other theory you care to dream up, structuralist, symbolic, interactionist, whatever viewpoint, then this is where you nail your ideological flag to the mask and say, this is the, the form of ideology I am particularly enraptured by, and I will be analysing these interviews in the light of this this ideology. And you can also mention the emic etic thing. Mm. Are you studying this topic as an insider or as an outsider to the, the, the religion, the dieting, the advertising issues in question? Then you go on to your findings, which is the longest section in terms of word count. This is where you put the bulk of your um, effort into, as it were. Use the code table with the various colour codes you come up with as subheadings um, to, to discuss the themes, the codes you've explored, and how the theories, including some of the theories you mentioned in your litany, bring those back into it. How theory relates and explains your findings. Um, you can either full on quote chunks from the interviews, or you can use the line numbering system to say, um, when the issue of such and such a thing was mentioned by interviewee A and interviewee B in lines 12 
35 and 41. Therefore, you don't actually have to give the quote, you're just giving the numbers. You can, you can do that way to reference from theory to actual things in the brain you're wanting to use. And that's how you bump the grade up. So use those codings as subheadings in finding sections. The discussion and conclusion of it are actually quite short. And it's really just a summation of what you've found, what the key issues are, and what you feel is the main theory that serves to explain the kind of answers you got from the various people you interviewed. And the conclusion is also where you put in your recommendation for future research, that you didn't have the work out time, sanity, to go over certain issues which were there were interesting. You would have liked to have mentioned them, you didn't have the wherewithal. And therefore these issues would be worth future looking at, or maybe only occur to you after the interview was over and done with that you could have asked certain questions and therefore a future research project could answer these other questions you didn't get the chance to answer. Bung in your references as per normal, bung in your appendix section, which should include the coded transcripts and the brief and the debrief um, that you utilized with the interviewees, the before and the after bit, um, and anything else that you feel is particularly relevant sticking into the appendices. Job done, crack open the gin, end of your module once you've uploaded that. Any questions, say email or the chat function, you can ask questions that way um, as, as to how to go about either the layout or which particular theories would be more relevant than others to the kind of things that your interviewees have said. Ah, right, my throat's going to be sandpaper by the end of this. So, a little bit now about bias, and you might find some of this directly useful to that assignment in that you might want to talk about elements of bias coming into interviews. This not only applies to interviews, it can apply to things like surveys and questionnaires too. So you're off, you're asked your questions of your interviewees or your surveyees or whoever, whatever. Are you sure you've got completely honest answers from these people? Sometimes the answer hopefully to that question is yes, but there will be other times when you start to wonder, mm, have they given me completely honest answers? And this is where the bias comes into it. So acquiescent bias, which I mentioned a minute ago, is where the person you're talking to says what they think you want to hear. They're trying to please you. So they're not saying a, a, an honest answer, they're saying a pleasing answer. Now, where can that happen? If you're interviewing or experimenting with kids, that can happen, which is a good reason to avoid children at all costs on the academic front. Um, it was a criticism made of Piaget, for example, that people, a number of people felt that maybe the kids had been just giving him the answers they thought he wanted rather than giving him full on honest answers. And he hadn't tweeted that fact when he was conducting the research. Um, this is a particular issue if the people you are interviewing, and I say this is going to be the case for just about all of you, um, are people you were either related to or friendly with prior to the interview. So they're not strangers, they are known to you. If it's someone who is known to you, are they going to get a sense of, I bet she wants to know about this, I bet he wants to know about that. And so they'll give you answers they think you want to hear because they know you, rather than straightforward, honest answers. You might also, in the same vein, get social desirability with this. Now that can work in two ways. The first way, which is where the person is known to you so you ask them a question and the honest answer would necessitate them saying something that might shock you, something you don't know and they don't want you to know. And so they keep their gob shut about that and instead they give you a polite answer, uh, which may not be an honest one. So that can happen when they, they, they want to seem socially likable. They're a friend, they're a relative, they want you to go on liking them. And so they keep very quiet about something that you are unaware of, which they avoid telling you about in the course of the interview. The other side of this is that if you are asking about very controversial issues, so these days we'll stick with the theme so far, it could be about sexism, it could be about um, hating, disliking gay people, it could be about racism or some other, one of those kind of issues. And the honest answer would be for them to admit to holding a viewpoint, which these days is very politically incorrect. And so you've asked a question about this. You go up to them and you say, in effect, 
are you a racist? Well, who is going to turn around and say, yes, I am? Even if they are, they're unlikely to tell you that they are. And so instead, they're more likely to give you the socially desirable answer, which makes them sound all trendy and PC and right on, which is not the honest answer. And so it's very difficult if you're conducting that kind of research into that kind of an issue, racism, sexism, whatever, uh, to get fully honest answers because people are, are likely to conceal their true views behind a mask of social acceptability. How you get around that is a really challenging one. There's also what's referred to as demand characteristics, whereby um, there is something integral to the participant, the person being studied, that changes how they engage with the study. So, for example, if the person in question is a student on the social sciences, one of a, a social science subject, or they have been a student on it at some point in their life, at any rate, even if they aren't currently, uh, and obviously a lot of research gets conducted in universities on students because they're a nice, easy bunch of people to bully and to take them out and experiment and research. Then they already know how social science works. And they might sit there thinking, aha, I know where you're going with these questions. I can second guess what you're up to. And they might start to, if they like you, give you useful but possibly not true information that plays into your hypothesis or your research topic, or if they don't much like you or they think the experiment's badly designed, they might be deliberately awkward and give you unhelpful, but also not true answers, uh, participate in an awkward way rather than a supportive way. Um, your temperament can also be a factor. You come along, you've had a really bad day, you're tired, you're angry, you're stressed, you're hungry, or equally you're happy and jolly and bouncy. And whether you're in a really good mood or a really bad mood rubs off on the participants and they react accordingly and that determines how they respond to you. It's another element of demand characteristics. And finally, you might have someone um, who, even if they're not a student, they have this is not the first time they've taken part in interviews or surveys or what have you. They've done it from these days. There must be a ton of people who've been participants in interviews and surveys and things in the course of their life. So they've done it before, they know how all of this works, and that impacts on how they react and what they say. And maybe a first time person who's never been interviewed before or never been surveyed before might react and answer differently, perhaps. Extreme responding is flagged up as specific to certain cultures, the Middle East, for example, Latin America, where if you're giving someone, let's say, a like at scale, where one means strongly disagree and 10 means strongly agree and all the other numbers in the middle. Um, in certain cultures, you tend to get loads of people who go for strongly agree or strongly disagree and hardly anyone goes in the middle. It's a cultural factor. Um, quite why it works that way, well, that, that's a subject for debating itself. But some cultures, when they're asked questions, tend to be passionate in their answers uh, and don't tend to give bland, neutral, down the middle answers, even if actually that's how they feel about the issue. They want to be seen as passionate and strong in their views. They don't want to be seen as bland and kind of you know, watered down in their views. The same is found with IQ levels and educational levels. The more educated people are, or the higher IQ they are, and do bear in mind, of course, those are not one and the same thing. You can get very clever people who haven't had much education and very educated people who are as thick as two short plants. Um, so they don't always go hand in glove. But the more education or the higher the IQ, you tend to find the more middle of the road the answers are. And conversely, the less education or the lower the IQ, the, the more extreme the answers are, either very, you know, very strongly disagree or very strongly agree rather than floating somewhere in the middle. Just to add to the layers of confusion, neutral responses is when somebody goes for all of the answers in the middle, not because they actually think like that, but because they're really bored. And usually they get really bored if it's a very, very long series of questions. And so it reaches the point when they think, oh, I've had enough of this. And they just tick all the middle answers. So they're not giving you their actual views, they're just going for the least effort answer possible 
than if it's a question, an interview rather than a survey. They're giving you one word, two word answers, the kind of least effort answers rather than involved answers because they've just got fed up with it. Which is a good argument for having short to the point interviews and surveys and so on rather than long rambling ones. Whereupon we reach the end, and this is the second time I've recorded this lecture because bloody loom deleted the first time. And so never mind, let's hope it works this time. Um, next week for your final lecture, boom, ba -dum, boom, boom, we'll get on to autoethnography and visual ethnographies and start chatting about dissertation ideas and the kind of methodologies you may or may not use. Um, there'll be a little bit on that in the PowerPoint, but the majority of that will do through a chat room or something similar, so you can bounce ideas around with each other as well as with me. Ah, hopefully this recording will work and you'll be able to listen to it. Any questions, the usual, you know, email me or chat room, whatever. Um, and we might try something like Skype or Zoom to have the visual element rather than just typing messages, because some people might find that more engaging and worthwhile than just typing messages on the chat function. But take care, stay safe. See you hopefully before not too much longer. <laughs>